Hello, and uh, good evening, morning, middle of the night, whatever time of day it happens to be for you right now. I hope you're enjoying it. Uh, welcome back to the 17th installment of Liam Smala Bridges, A History of Newfoundland by D.W. Prowse. Now 15 pages at a time, every day, or until the bars reopen. And let's be real, we're finishing this fucking book. Um... Good to see you guys. Hope everyone's staying safe. Uh, one second. I'm almost out of beer. Caved. Wanted. Really been hankering for draft beer lately, so I went and got myself the old Heineken keg here. Really easy to order from the liquor store. Thank you for that experience. It was actually faster for me to go to the liquor store with an advanced order, walk in. Oh my god, there's some pile of foam. Pretty good though. Um, and get it faster than if I had actually gone in the store browsing around. So, uh, yeah, right on. I guess while I wait for that to settle, we'll uh, we'll recap from last week. So last week, yes, I wish these were a week in between each other. From yesterday, or a few hours ago, or what? I don't know anymore. Anyway, last episode, we finished off by talking about Captain Graves, who eventually got promoted to Lord Graves. So good for you, Mr. Graves. Um, uh, at this point in time, uh, where we're at page 315, uh, France had held St. John's for a hot minute, remember that? Um, they even managed to take Carbonier, which had yet, at this point in time, to be stoned. They had like a fort on an island or something like that in Carbonier. They managed to take that and destroy it. Um, everything else at the time was still being held, fortified by the English, Taco Bay Bulls, Fairland, Placentia, the other stuff. Um, so that's just where we're at in terms of who has what, because I know it's getting a little bit uh, weird. Uh, but so yeah, Fairland Babels, uh, that was held by uh, Amherst, the other the other G who uh, who really got shit done coming up through Kitty Vitty, sneaking up on the Signal Hill and winning St. John's back. Um, that happens after where we are right now. It's I know back and forth and back and forth. Uh, so okay, so to start out, DW gets into some local records um, from in Placentia where I don't know a couple of court justices were sort of doling out their own interpretation of the rules and stuff. They were like. Just kind of making their own. They were setting prices for food in different areas. Like, you know, if you wanted salt in this town, it would be so much or so much different over here. Almost like oil prices. You know how they just change depending on where you're to. It was like, he was doing that for like, I don't know, fucking potatoes. But like, whatever it was. Like, it was just really hands-on, really arbitrary. These guys were just, there was two of them down there. They were like lusting for power and stuff. Um, uh, yeah, they were setting up arbitrary prices, various locations. They set up weird, other weird rules. Obviously, they were looking out for themselves first and foremost. Um, for instance, in 1762, some dude set up, uh, the first custom house, which is like customs, you know, um, doing that, but he had trouble when the fishing admirals gave him all kinds of shit for it, trying to deal with those two guys who were probably on the take from the admirals or whatever, and he just left the next year. I mean, it's not a really great detail, it's not a very funny fucking story or anything, but most of these amusing tales in this book are pretty dry, maybe, um... No, I'm not even going to say that they were amusing for 1895. I think they're just... I think D.W. was probably just kind of a boring guy. Um, okay, onward and <laughs> upward. Uh, in 1763, the famous Captain Cook took his survey of our island. Um, I have a quote here on page 316 that says, In 1763, the survey of the island was commenced by the immortal navigator Cook. He had been employed as a master in the Navy at the Siege of Louisbourg. Uh, with great gallantry in the face of the enemy's shot and shell, he had sounded and surveyed the St. Lawrence and piloted the fleet in Wolfe's last fight. Cook was master of the Northumberland in Lord Colville's squadron in 1762 and had also been, a new, uh, been in Newfoundland under Governor Graves. Uh, he returned in 1764 with Sir Hugh Palliser, or Palliser? I'm going to say Palliser. Pa Palliser. Sir Hugh. Huey boy. Sir Palliser. Um, so Palliser, who highly appreciated his scientific ability and sterling qualities. Cook was engaged in the arduous work of surveying for four years until 1767. His account of an eclipse of the sun seen at Burgio was published in the Philosophical Transactions and added greatly to his reputation as a skilled scientist. At Burgio Islands and several other places on the Newfoundland coast, his survey marks are still pointed out to this day. I assume that they maybe still are now. Um, so here we have a picture of Cook's map, which is like, that's kind of, that's pretty good. That's a pretty detailed fuck. It's the closest one we've had yet. And you can't read a fucking thing on it, but not too bad. Um, so here, yeah, so, okay. 
Oh, draft beer, so nice. Uh, to this day, Cook's chart of our island is noted for its minute, 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 minute accuracy. It shows the indomitable perseverance and genius of the man who, from the very lowest origin, a poor cabin boy, solely by his own exertions, rose to the rank of captain in the Navy and the highest position in his age as a navigator, nautical astronomer, and scientific observer. Good on you, Mr. Captain Cook. Um, real, uh, real rags to riches story there for you, sir. Um... Now we're going to... Okay, yeah. So Captain Cook was a big supporter of the island, apparently, as well. And he really he really uh, thought highly of our future and our potential as, as a spot. Not only, not only for fishing and whaling, salmon, and stuff like that, but he was actually the first guy to identify Newfoundland as being a good source of coal. Um, it's, it's suggested that he must have been bombing around on the fucking west coast of the island somewhere, saw coal <laughs> it said that he it says that he's seen it in the book they're kind of like we don't know where captain cook kind of gets off talking about coal but he must have seen it otherwise it's like a kind of a weird thing to just fucking bring up so anyway captain cook big supporter of the island we're a big supporter of you thanks for the map um on page 319 here okay so we're going to jump back into talking about palliser palissier anyway this guy becomes like governor or fucking commodore or something like that um so we're going to talk about sir hugh palliser um, I called him Pallister through all my notes, so I'm really struggling to get that T out of there. So I call him Pallister. That's, I, I, I take a drink. I don't know. Okay, anyway, so Pallister, who succeeded Admiral Graves, um, so he, he's the Admiral now, I guess. Uh, this guy gets notoriety because he brought charges against some other fucking guy named Admiral Keppel. Um, I don't know what their beef was. Um, I think it's more to do with, he talks about him bringing this guy Admiral, which I guess an Admiral to bring up another Admiral on charges may have been something big, but basically this, it's more about how he just kept everything sort of to the letter. This Palliser was really, he wasn't a bad guy, but he was very by the book, like very strict on the interpretations of the rules, a bit more of an extremist in terms of how the written word was to be interpreted. Um, so he, yeah, on page 319, I've, I've got a bit of a passage here. Palliser has been highly praised in our histories. In some respects, he's entitled to our gratitude. The bounty for the uh, the fishery in the Act uh, Act 15, George III, whatever. Uh, it's called Palliser's Act. He had his own act that was, uh, uh, it's un undoubtedly due to his exertions. Uh, so he, he was, like I said, he was a champion of the island in terms of the fishery and stuff. Uh, he defined the French rights under the Treaty of Paris, Paris honestly and clearly. According to uh, his lights, according to his lights, um, he was an excellent governor in labors incessant, the sp in the very spirit of unrest, remarkably clear-headed, but very dictatorial. Um, the governor had only one great fault. Beyond his own circumscribed vision, he could see no horizon. He had no faith, no hope, no future for the colony. The one narrow, insular idea of the age pervaded his official mind. Uh, that it should be a fishing colony used for one great purpose only in his eyes, which was supplying men for the Navy. So he didn't see Newfoundland as, like, a long term. He was just, like, he the here and the now. Just, uh, like, tunnel vision, laser focused, right? Uh, with this aim, every other, uh, every other consideration, every attempt to promote settlement, cultivation, and civilization must be ruthlessly swept aside. Uh, on all who opposed his views, he poured out the vials of his wrath. The vials of his wrath. That's nice words there, D.W., should have been a poet. No, just kidding. <laughs> Long poems. Um, he could clearly, uh, and he could see clearly enough that the settlement could not be prevented. It was going to happen anyway. So he abused the colony and the colonists. No ruler since the days of Charles II hated the country he was set over more bitterly than Sir Hugh's Palliser. So he was respected because he did the job, but he fucking, it's like, like, why do you hate this place so much? So... Um, he didn't really necessarily feel about it the same way that Captain Cook felt about it, whereas Cook was like, this place is fucking great, man, we got whales, fish, fucking coal, do you guys, have you guys heard about coal? Coal! Um, meanwhile, Palliser was like, uh, this is to feed the Navy boys, and that's fucking it. Um, so just so you get an idea of what he was like, um, now when the Treaty of Paris went into effect, this was basically like a death stroke for our friends, the Basque fishermen. Um, the guys from the Spanish province or peninsula, whatever the, wherever the Basque, Basque Biscayans came from. Um, so this was bad for them because the English were just like, no, man, there's certainly no settling here. The French are like just as it is allowed. The French are only allowed to like fish, dry fish and get the fuck out. Like that's all the no settling, that sort of shit. Um, 
So now when the Treaty of Paris went into effect, it was a death stroke for the fishermen uh, from Bis the Biscayan fishermen. Pardon me, take a drink. In 1765, they even... Okay, so the Biscayans, this was their workaround. They wanted so badly to, like, still come over and stuff because they were like, what do you mean? Like, we can't go... I feel like the Biscayans have been kind of just, like kicked around this whole thing that like they just want to come fish and they're sort of at the mercy of all these other fucking wars between the English, Spanish, and French. Um, I do kind of feel bad for those guys. So they came over and we're like, um, so let's just man our boats and call the boats English names. And apparently to some degree that kind of worked. Um, they just kind of came over, fished and got out. Um, so again, that's almost like another example of Palliser being kind of okay. I don't know if it was him directly that let that kind of shit go on, but there was a little bit of sneaking around by that. Anyway, DW just casually mentions uh, the Biscayans there. Um, they had a trouble because they're, you know, they're West Coast whalers and sealers, shore fishermen, stuff like that. Okay. Um, Palliser was strict with enforcing his interpretation of the Paris Treaty, not to be confused with the Treaty of Utrecht. Um, he had no issue taking the catch from the French. Like, so if, if, there's one, there's one little bit here in the book where the French, um, caught a whale. At one point, the French, they caught a whale, and a dude was like, no, you're not allowed to catch whales. You're here, you're only allowed to catch codfish. No salmon, no whales, no seals. I don't even want to see a fucking crab on your boat. And so they took the whale and sold it, just out from under him. Like, so he was really strict about that. So why, but he, while he was enforcing on the French, he would also punish the English if they fucked with the French, you know, just because they were old enemies. That doesn't mean he was like really to the letter on the treaty. So if a word came out that there was some English boats fucking or impeding on um, a, a French fishing spot or whatever, you know, like if a French guy shows up, he's the first guy in the harbor and he can, he can choose his place and some people harass him, then no, like that's not cool either. So he was like, Palliser was, de he definitely wasn't having any wars break out on his fucking side of things. So that in that way, you know, tough but fair, I guess, is the way to go. But, you know, apparently he still had a lot of disdain for the island people. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, I went over that. Um, yeah, so he was pretty into doing things by the book. I bet this guy was a real fucking pleasure to have at parties. Um, on page 322, I have a quote. Palliser's interpretation admits of no doubt it was held to be a concurrent fishery in which all disputes were to be decided by English authorities alone, right? So French could be there, but if there's a dispute, he's the one making the ruling. There's no French input from it. You're, you're just kind of under our laws. Um, it only included a cod fishery. This is for the French. The French only included a cod fishery. It gave no right whatsoever uh, to the French to catch salmon, to trade, or traffic. Um, they were to only fish for codfish and dry them on land. They were not even permitted to cut spars or to build boats. Like, strictly fish, dry, and leave. Um, and that same treaty, up until 1895, anyway, was still in operation. So the Treaty of Paris is still on the go when this book was written. Don't know what the situation is now. That's not my problem. I'm stuck back in the 1700s. I'll catch up to you guys in 2020 fucking another time. Um, okay, so Palliser, yeah, so also Palliser, who was in charge for four years. So he was, like, he did a lot, but he was only there for four years. He was also in charge of dealing with the smuggling and, like, the managing of these customs houses and stuff like that. So when customs, I said one custom house tried to open, and then we had other, you know, other ones eventually did open as more trade came from New England and stuff like that. So he was in charge of managing the operations of that stuff, dealing with the serious amounts of smuggling that was happening coming up from New England and stuff at the time, um, which couldn't have been easy. Again, he was only there for four years. Um, so on 323, I have here, oh, this one's, this one's a chunk. Okay, so the governor was directed by the authorities at home in England um, to give his special attention to the prevention of smuggling. In 1764, the act had been passed which caused such disturbance in New England. It armed the... Oh, which card just... Which, it's the way you, you say stuff. Uh, in 1764, the act had been passed which caused such disturbance in New England. It armed the Custom House authorities with new powers of seizure, arrest, etc., and directly gave a bounty to the governor and informer in all such cases. His Excellency getting one-third of the plunder, so you bust a guy, you get a third of the bounty. There's some fucking incentive for you. Uh, his accounts for Palliser's abnormal activity in searching... Oh, it explains for uh, Palliser's abnormal activity in searching out illicit... So he cra He was keen to crack down on the smuggling because he was like, I'm going to make a fucking mint here. I'm going to have all the, the terrible shitty rum you can handle. Um, the Newfoundland government, in addition, had special instructions to look, at, look after the New Englanders, well known for their smuggling proclivities. No doubt Sir Hugh gave them a great deal of trouble, but they had beat him, as they had beaten all the custom house officers in America. They had an invincible prejudice and objection to the payment of duties of any kind to King George, and they lied like troopers. Um, that's the word. 
Um, so yeah, they, they, they tried, but the smugglers, smugglers gonna smuggle, man. Fuck crime, like, always find a way, right? It's like when you watch those shows on prison, they're like talking to each other, sending notes down through the toilet system. It's like, how'd you guys figure that out? But there's always a way, right? Where there's a will. Um, and when you don't like paying taxes enough, you'll certainly find a way. Um, okay. Um, oh, so Governor Pallister was all, he was also interested in Labrador. Remember L Labrador? Um, well, Remember I said that that was annexed back to us from Canada. So Palliser's got an in, you know an interest in getting that on the go, getting a fishery set up, having game you know markets set up there. So um, let's use it. And on page three twenty four, it says Governor Palliser took a great interest in Labrador and Anticosti, uh, which is another area up that way, which had been annexed to his government in seventeen sixty three. He encouraged the salmon fishery and laid down rules and regulation of the cod fishery in Labrador as a ship fishery. His Excellency was the first to establish friendly relations with the Eskimos and Mountaineer Indians. Uh, one of his proclamations threatens the most severe punishments against the French, whom he declares did last year, blah, 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 do some bad stuff um, against the English, I guess. Um, Sir Hugh made a treaty with the Labrador Indians in his dealings with the savages. I'm going to make a point about that. Um, and in looking after the interests of the fishermen, he was kind, humane, and considerate. For French aggressors, for smuggling New Englanders, and for riotous Irishmen, he seems to have been full of all the narrow prejudice of the age. So it's like you play ball, you know, the the Indians and stuff, he, he was kind, he worked things out, they had good relations. If you fucked around, you're laying around, right? That was that was sort of this guy. I mean, I kind of respect that. Um, riotous Irishman, he seems to have been full of all the narrow prejudice of the age. He was especially distinguished for his barbarous treatment of Roman Catholic Irishmen. He wouldn't even allow any two of them to live in one dwelling, and none were permitted to keep public houses. Cool. That's nice. Yeah. The Irish get it pretty bad in this too, don't we? Okay, so he mentions there at one point, he says his dealings with the savages. So he, he's talking about how he just made a treaty, and he's talking about his dealings with the savages. And in a footnote at the end of the page here, there is a story about um, uh, making list, making some contact with um, the Beothic around exploits, um, where the guys showed up unarmed. They, they kind of had a standoff. They showed up to a point. The, these guys show up, and they're like, huh. And then the Beothic show up, and they're like, they stop, and they're like, huh. And then the English, like, unarmed come up, and they're like, hey, hey, hey. And then apparently the, the story goes that uh, one of the Indians, they, they put their arm around them, like, in, in just, like, like friendship. Like, there was, it, it, what appeared, obviously, there was a language barrier, but what the story goes that there, there appeared to be camaraderie, and their arm in arm and stuff like that. But while the Indian had, uh, fuck, while the Beothic, I'm so sorry, while the Beothic had his arm over the other guy, one of the other Beothic came and stabbed him in the back, and as soon as that, that triggered a flurry of arrows, which killed but it was just like a, a, a sneak attack or a lure in or an ambush or something like that. So I think that's why DW uses the language savages here. But you do have to remember that he does mention earlier in the book that history is written by the winners. We don't know what their side of the story is. Okay, we don't know what happened. Remember remember when one guy shot the gun and it fucked up the entire like peace, like the attempt at peace before? This was like uh, over 100 years ago, like how things have been going. So you don't know. What could have happened before? What could have happened after? But anyway, um, it's just why he uses the word savages and he refu refers to them uh, as being a, a treacherous people um, compared to other, uh, you know, the, the Canadian, uh, as he refers to as the Canadian Indians and other indigenous populations who there were, there were good dealings with, even maybe if they were allied with the French, there was still good connection made. He does say that the, the Beothic in particular were more aggressive or more violent. Um, I'll I'll leave it there because um, you know fucking any who's will be. Um, okay, so anyway, moving on to like courtrooms. Um, at this time, the courtrooms, uh, the legal jargon was still super weird. So they're still trying to establish like a real court of law or a court system here. And while poor uh, Buddy Boy is trying to like establish laws and, and get things going. Um, he was, wait, yeah, so, yeah, the legal jargon was weird, because it was still all old-timey, there was a mention where, like, all the laws and stuff were sent over from England, instead of set, setting up our own sort of shit here, so they're reading off these old, like, 
texts and stuff. It says here, yeah, in reading our local records, it is remarkable that whilst there was not a single lawyer in the colony, the legal jar jargon was as copious, complicated, and ab as absurd as anything to be found in the pages of Chitty on Pleadings, which I'm sure Chitty on Pleadings was the mad magazine of 1895. Um, but it was, it was apparently superfluous, ridiculous. Um, there's a quote here. I have a note here that just says ridiculous. Um, it just, it reads so like f fanciful and his king and God before it gets really like mythical and is describing as someone's crime. It's just words for the sake of words. I suppose the boys didn't have TV and podcasts and like Instagram live and shit like that. Um, so anyway, it was some very colorful, frivolous writing. Um, I don't know, fuck, I don't know why he makes mention of that, but it's at 15 pages an episode, I better include everything. Um, on page 327, he first, uh, okay, so this is, um, uh, Palliser, again, now he's Commodore. So, Palliser, uh, he first, his first task is to build a fort in Fort Pitt, which is up north. He wants to establish a fort in Labrador. Now, what happens is he'd been, uh... All over the island, and he was he was having a lot of pushback from the admirals, from especially the French, the French Canadians, and uh, English, uh, not English, um, American uh, whale fishermen, stuff like that up on the west coast. So you're thinking off the west coast of the island, the St. Lawrence, and stuff like that. Um, so he's going up that way, he's getting a lot of pushback, um, bullshit from the French Canadians, whalers. I guess they wanted to get away with more stuff up north. They just a permanent base settlement would mean more oversight and less hauling one over the eyes, I think. Anyway, that didn't go so great. So anyway, Palliser doesn't get that fort done up up north. He kind of sees what's going on. Anyway, he comes back to St. John's and everything is basically fucked. He says he goes back to St. John's. The place is like half at war. The people are split between Placentia and England. I guess, I guess war has broken out with the French or... It, it, he literally just says he came back and it was like full of war. Um... Uh, Commodore Palliser, wait, 327, yeah, Commodore Palliser's administration lasted for the unusual period of four years. Remember, because we were always changing Commodores and Governors and stuff? Um, his records, Palliser's records, are the longest and by far the most complete. He was an admirable man of business, orderly, methodical, and in industrious, yeah, instructorious, industrious. Um, he had set his heart on making his newly acquired territory of Labrador, Anticosti, and the Magdalen Islands... Um, into a great fishery governed by the rules of William's Act. Um, so that's that's when that was his plan. That's when he went up to Labrador. He comes back down. Things aren't going so great. Um, okay, so yeah, that's just shit's going down in St. John's. He doesn't really um, talk about what's that. Anyway, Palliser, it, it's, it's all right that he didn't build a fort up there because uh, Labrador gets annexed back to fucking Canada like right after. So probably. Probably all for the best. Imagine putting up a fort all the way up there and then be like, ah, we're going to give that to Canada now. Okay, um, so at this point it says, um, the whole New England trade in Newfoundland uh, with the colony was one vast smuggling operation, basically. Uh, so we're going to talk about smuggling real quick. Um, the smuggling at the time is gone mental. Um, I, you know, we already kind of mentioned that. Um, and during... During Pal Palliser's time, a commercial war of sorts was now starting to break out between England and America, right? Because we're getting real close to 1776 now. So the problem being, you know, no taxation without representation. So the taxing and the unfair fucking bullshit that England was trying to exert over New England, um, this is, so the commercial war was what built up sort of to the regular, or part, you know, part of many things that built up to the regular war. Um, and that was starting to break out between England and America. Almost kick out. The straw that broke the camel's back was actually called the Molasses Act. So, I mean, someone was fucking with the Lassie Bonds, I guess. Um, and then that turned into the Stamps Act. So then, so, I don't know, you couldn't be mailing molasses, or I don't know what the deal was. But anyway, um, there was a long, there's a long going on. Um, they had, and just one last quote here. Uh, like some regulations of the English government indicate the absurd lengths to which they carried on their trade laws. They stopped coal mining in Nova Scotia, fearing that it would interfere uh, with England coal and encourage provincial manufacturers. So keeping it, they wanted us here in Nova Scotia, England, uh, Newfoundland to depend on England's coal. So they shut it down in Nova Scotia because they were, and they w wouldn't want it to be going to the Americans either, right? Uh, they were always jealous 
of colonial homespun woolen and coarse linen cloths, Palliser's letters show the strong prejudice that existed against New England long before the Revolutionary War. Um, and that takes us to page 229, 329. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna finish page three twenty nine just because it gets. It, we start talking more about uh, religion. We're just kind of jumping. I mean, in the way that D W jumps from topic to topic, literally from this paragraph to this paragraph, we go from New England smugglers and trade war before the Revolutionary War to talking about like nothing appeals more higher to the higher sentiments than the poetic feeling that is implanted on us than the self sacrificing devotion of a religious community to its worship and its ministries typified amongst us by the warm attachment of the Irish to the poor hunted and silenced priests who ministered to their spiritual needs in Newfoundland. I'm not getting into it. That's going to conclude today. I'm happy to be finished guys. Um, no more reports today. That's nice. Um, I hope, I hope everybody is, I say this every fucking day. So you, just keep on keeping on, and uh, we'll be back tomorrow with the 18th installment of Liam Small Bridges of History of Newfoundland by T.W. Prowse. 15 pages at a time every day or until they reopen the bars, what I wouldn't give to pull up to a nice oak top. Bar, have someone pretty come over and pour up a big ice cold mug, black horse. Anyway, no sense in thinking about it because it's not going to be until like 2024 by the time it gets out of this. Anyway, guys, signing off for today. My name is Liam Small. Uh, you can catch me on Instagram at, at Slack of All Trades or on Facebook at uh, Liam Small Does Comedy. I think I'm going to try and get um a youtube page up just just somewhere to host all of these episodes and it's, it's just easier to link to and from i think um any feedback anything i've gotten blatantly wrong please let me know um more than willing to do corrections it's all i can do to squeeze this reading in and do this every day um i'm in the middle of it now you know what i mean like it's it's have, like it's in a big book and uh people i've so people are, in, you know, more interested in that, the actual dimensions of the book. I wish I could get you something for scale, but you guys can see it. And, uh, I don't know. Um, there's been mention of me doing another series or something after this. Um, we've joked around about doing the Bible or doing, um, like War and Peace by Tolstoy. You know, it's all jokes. I'm not going at either of those things, but if there's something, maybe even I've got this cool, like, metal batman set thing where you make an aluminum batmobile and it's out of these two things so like that could be tedious and maddening who knows maybe we'll do that anyway guys i'm rambling um i'm gonna go uh play guitar or learn to cross stitch or juggle or stand in my head or shave my eyebrows i don't know anyway uh stay healthy uh i don't know tell your mother you loves her see you guys see you tomorrow